This podcast is sponsored by Untapped. Untapped is about working with organisations to develop a sustainable, neurodiverse employment ecosystem. How fantastic is that? This includes the Neurodiversity Hub to assist students become more work ready and increase their chances of securing a job. Dyslexia and the workplace. Such a complex topic. And as any of my regular listeners will know, is a topic close to my heart. Not just because of the challenges I faced in the workplace, but also because, well, I am doing my doctorate in it. I wanted to see if other people were having as many difficulties as I had. And what I've found is that many are struggling like me in the workplace. That's why I'm building a series of dyslexia and neurodiversity workplace podcasts that showcase the wide variety of work that is happening in Australia and how together we can raise the profile of dyslexia and improve workplace practices. Today's guest is an accomplished neurodiversity advocate, a business leader and human resource consultant with over 20 years experience leading teams and developing leaders. Her career spans the Australian built environment, manufacturing, building and hardware, merchandise support services, civil construction, and the list goes on. Thank you so much for coming on the show this afternoon, Sally. I'm so excited to be talking to you about uh, dyslexia and neurodiversity in the workplace. Thanks, Shay. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Can you give us a little bit of a background of your work experience and how you come to work in the inclusion and diversity space? Sure. Um, I've been um, working in sort of people leadership type roles for um, a bit over 20 years now and um, I think always been interested in coaching and developing other people and in doing that um, you really get to learn what people's uh, learning capabilities are like bringing in that awareness piece what really helps people thrive in the workplace so uh, my working life has been around 15 years in operational leadership in um, FMCG and retail uh, and then that segued through into uh, retail coaching and development uh, and then into human resources and then into the manufacturing sector and, and, in, and in HR in manufacturing. Uh, and in the last two and a half years, I've um, been working for myself, consulting and doing a lot of leadership development, uh, neurodiversity type work in the workplace and we're building awareness and so forth. So it's been a a progression from the interest in people to the interest in helping people be at their best in the workplace. Um, and I've always really enjoyed work. That's um, been a big part of um, my life, fulfillment, I guess, and until I had my son 10 years ago. And then as it turns out, uh, William is also has dyslexia. I was already interested in um, helping people with uh, disadvantages or learning disabilities. And then just ironically having a son with, with a learning difficulty um, brought, brought that experience to a very sort of more personal setting, yeah. So before having William, had you seen uh, in the workplace, had you come across people that had dyslexia or that were neurodiverse that were struggling? Yes, I had. I had already um, just through the, the coaching um, and training element. It's you know, a part of an, an adult learning space where people come into a training situation and um, you can tell straight away some people are apprehensive about being there or they seem to be participating um, verbally but not participating when they break out into group work or they're not going to uh, write. You know how you got break out of group work and some people do the butcher's paper writing or post-it note writing. You just sort of make observations as as a trainer that they're, they're very much hands-on learner and verbal, but won't be picking up the pen. So you sort of start noticing, oh, is there a literacy issue or is there a learning difficulty? And the same with people that are very, might be quiet in, the work, in, in a workplace training environment. Um, and then when they broke out into like a think pair share situation, where there's just two people um, sharing stories, all of a sudden they become much more um, in, like involved in the learning um, and they're happy to actually write and, and get involved. So that's a different, that might be to do with autism or something like that where they, they don't have a learning difficulty with, with um, reading and writing, but more have difficulty with the, um, group, the, the whole group overwhelm 
of a, of a training situation. So I've, yeah, I, I think I made those observations not based on uh, being academically trained in that field, but more wanting to hold a, hold a training session that everyone was included in and enjoyed. So was there any training that you had to help um, help you look at those differences in learning and that some people might have low literacy skills or have a learning difficulty or disability that made you aware? Because over the last 20 years, um, those concepts have been emerging. Um, so how did you know? What, what helped you to be able to give people that support or to identify them? Yeah, probably more in the, the behavioural observations, but it wasn't specific training. No, I, I will say the training to actually get your, you know, so workplace training and assessment does teach about adult learning principles and that helps, you know, people realise or you realise that there's different learning preferences and learning styles. Um, leadership training teaches about how to actually identify different motivational coaching and people's thinking preferences um, and communication styles. So I think it was a conglomerate of all those things, Shay. But this will, may sound a bit unusual, but I think one of the things that had helped me before I actually did study more about it, before I had William, was um, being brought up with my parents who were very empathetic and compassionate. So I'd say they have very strong family values. And my mother used to always, you know, make on talk about um, if someone's having a bad day, there's possibly a reason for that and that it's a gift if you can make other people smile and be happy and not to make assumptions if people aren't participating. Um, and we also had, um, we, we were part of like Wesley Do Care and Wesley Mission and um, we had people with, from the uh, Blind Society come and play with us. It was like a play group thing. This is back in the um, late 70s, Shay, <laughs> uh, where the kids would have play gates with kids that were, didn't have disabilities. And so these are, these are like events that happened in my life, but it, I guess as you get older, you realise it all comes together as to how um, you have a greater awareness. So I think awareness is the key, that it starts from somebody pointing it out. Um, in, this, in this instance, it was my, my mother and my dad um, and then it continuing on through my life. And so at what point in your working career did you come across the terms learning disability or dyslexia or neurodiversity? In my working career, I didn't come across it until I was got the qualification for training, which was when I was about 25 and I'd started work at 17. So seven years in. So it's not that long. I guess it wasn't that far in, but yeah, it was a few years in um, before. And I'd worked for some major, you know, big retailers in Australia and was in a leadership position from the age of 19, managing teams of up to 45 people. So yeah, what certainly wasn't talked about in a corporate setting. Um, it was definitely attached to the training, adult learning element. And then neurodiversity um, was really only in the last three years, I'd say. It's a sort of a, a new term, newer, a newer term in, in Australia. And so what do you um, think in the corporate space, like how have they um, started to adjust to using those type of terms and supporting their staff that could be neurodiverse? I think the autism movement um, rather than the neurodiverse movement has come through in the last 10 years, particularly, I guess, in the last five and that's through the diversity and inclusion, the specialist arm of HR for diversity and inclusion leaders. Um, and I think that was championed by the LGBT and equal opportunity type movements. They were really the, led the way, led the charge. And then that's actually helped other elements of the workplace to say, well, uh, what, what, what about people with um, differences um, and learning differences and then um, or programs to help people with uh, autism. And also, I think the government's done a reasonably good job with helping people with disability return to the workplace. So there's definitely been a movement there with um, disability employment services or JSAs 
really focusing on joint ventures with larger corporates to create employment pathway programs for people with disability. And what are some of the positive changes that you've seen in the workplace since these movements have occurred for neurodiverse employees? Have you seen any? Yes, I have. I, I, the real positives is the acceptance and also some of the things that I think have been really exciting is that uh, more people are coming forward talking about their, their personal lived experience, their experience with their extended families, um, their partners and so forth. So there's hardly anyone in a workplace that either hasn't had a personal, doesn't have a uh, learning difficulty or is on the spectrum in some way or has a family member or a good friend or a neighbour. It's a bit like the mental health movement. It's very, very much um, across all people. And that the positive thing that I've noticed, Shay, is that when programs do come, sometimes they're over-engineered and workplaces think that they need to do a lot of work to actually get people into the workplace, but not as much is required as than, than what they assume. So it's good to do all that extra planning, um, but it's not as hard as you think is, I guess, my point. So that's some of the positives, yeah. So how do you think workplaces could be um, more inclusive of people that have differences so that it doesn't seem so onerous for them or such a big task? That's really... The onerous bit is really when someone is in a workplace setting where there isn't an awareness and there isn't conversation around differences. And I think that is extremely challenging. So I won't assume to say that it isn't. I think that if you're in a workplace where the conversation's easy to have, that, that it is still a challenge today for that. And I would imagine that would be happening in a lot of, a lot of workplaces, that it's still challenging. So what can workplaces do as leaders or people working in workplaces that are in leadership roles? How can we um, support them and upskill them to be able to have those conversations and to be able to increase that awareness of neurodiversity uh, within the workplace, do you think? Yeah, it's a great question, Shay, because I think that um, leaders may feel overwhelmed by all the expectations of trying to understand different can different conditions and whether to say something's a difference or a disability and people get a bit funny about worrying about all those things. Uh, however, my, my sort of message to leaders would be to attend some sort of training, like a two-hour two workshop or, or a workshop or go online and, and um, go on like your website and read some of the, um, listen to some of the podcasts and read a couple of case stories about people's lived experience and you'll realise that it's not it's not as challenging as, as it may seem to be. I think the biggest barrier is opening up the conversation and understanding that really what needs to happen is for people to feel comfortable to share what their situation is and then for a leader, the biggest advantage that they can have to help their team is to ask the person is to actually ask the person. That's all they need to do is sit the person down and, and have a conversation and listen. And then usually people that have um, accommodations or ways of coping in the workplace, they will share what their needs are as long as they're not put in a position where it's they're going to be ridiculed or shamed for it in any way. And do you have any... Um in your work history, have you ever come across any people with dyslexia that you've um, been able to help? That if we've got people listening that are leaders, they can, there's some strategies that might help them in um, supporting staff that are neurodiverse or that um, disclose that they've got a learning disability or difficulty. And we're chopping and changing, sorry for our listeners, we're chopping and changing the terms here um, a little bit, but. Dyslexia sits under the neurodiversity umbrella, which is why we're um, chopping and changing our language. Yeah. What's happened, what's happened um, in my experience is that uh, people that have come forward or in, been employed when the employer's known that they've had a, a disability through an employment, employment pathway program, that's been really positive um, for the employees because it's been part of their situation to be able to be 
all the accommodations and support is confirmed before they start and they start off on the right foot with whatever changes in the workplace are required. And, and usually that's time, uh, extra time and maybe some um, workplace adjustments, but often very minimal, more so the time and the support by one person to be sort of their champion. So I've seen multiple multiple examples of that been really, really successful. And where I've seen success, but it has started off on the wrong foot is where um, someone's been in the workplace uh, for a, quite a few years. I'm talking about a couple of people at once here, but th these examples are where people have worked in a workplace for a couple of years, everything's gone really, really well. And then um, their workplace situation has changed. And that change in the workplace, whether it be the speed of work or whether they've had a new team member that they've started working with has expected something different from them what, than what they've been doing. And all of a sudden that change has uh, brought about to be obvious that they've got a dif difficulty, like with di this, these examples I'm talking about is dyslexia. And then they haven't, the employer hasn't known that they have dyslexia and the employees are not wanting to disclose until it gets to a performance management type situation because there's difficulty in them achieving what they're meant to be doing in the, in the change of what their job is. And then after that situation, um, and, and in these instances I'm talking about where I've been in a HR position where human resources has been um, requested to support both the leader and the team member to find out what's going on with the team member's performance, then the team member has disclosed um, to myself that they have dyslexia. Um, and then the whole situation changes because once um, an employment situation is aware that there's accommodations that need to be made, then those accommodations can start to be made and the viewpoint changes because it's not, it's, it's not, it's no longer a misunderstanding. It's an understanding that, oh, okay, this is what's actually happened. And, and in these examples that I'm talking about, Shay, both of the leaders that um, I was supporting they felt terrible about sort of performance. They'd already had performance management type conversations verbally with the team members um, and the team members, because they were being performance managed, they didn't share that they, were, that had, they had dyslexia and that was the reason for the difficulty. But not until it sort of escalated to HR did they, did they share. So it did work. Those, those two examples I'm talking about were worked out okay in the end and and the team members were given those support um, that they needed which in both instances was to do with um, not too much writing in their workplace um, and not writing at a speed so doing sort of auditing and auditing type work wasn't at a speed wasn't suitable for them um, but had the leaders had had more awareness then they would have actually asked the question, is there another reason why, is there any other reason why you're finding this task difficult to do rather than performance managing them? I think they're really great examples and, you know, that re important reinforcement of asking the question or looking at are there other reasons why someone might be struggling in the workplace rather than it um, needing to go to performance management or looking like they're lazy or they've dropped off or... Um, they're not meeting their KPIs for whatever reason that, you know, then you need to look into those reasons. Yes. Um, yep. yeah, so thank you for sharing those because they're great examples. My other thought was when you were talking about disability, <coughs> using the disability pathway, um, I guess one of the challenges for people with dyslexia or people under the neurodiversity umbrella is that they don't, it, it's hard for them to come under that disability umbrella because it, it's hard to sometimes feel like it, to use the term disability. Exactly, yes. So how do we, um, and, you know, by law, if you have a learning disability, you're, you're protected under the number of different acts. Um, so we do need to use that term to help uh, ensure that we're protected in the workplace. But how do you think we can support employers to broaden their scope so it's not just a disability focus but it's a neurodiverse focus as well so you've got people coming in that of all different skill sets and strengths. Yeah I think um, broadening broadening their awareness um, which is happening but I suppose it's happening for those that have started thinking about it 
So the more um, organisations like like yourself, Shay, that are out there um, on on platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn, um, putting out uh, and YouTube putting out podcasts and information that someone might come across and go, oh, oh, that sounds familiar. Um, I've, I've noticed a team member doing that. That that um, like different behavioural traits or awareness pieces. Same with the are you okay type strategy where they're sort of saying, well, if people are acting different, maybe ask the question, are you okay? It's the same with learning. If somebody seems like they're not learning at the rate that they were and you notice a real difference between one task to another um, or one activity like group work versus individual work, the, the best thing a leader can do is ask the question and observe the difference and realise that that difference could well be autism or it could be dyslexia or dyspraxia if there's a you know, numbers situation. There's lots of different, I think it's just a matter of asking the question um, and realising that there's a lot more people with um, these differences. And are there um, some strategies you think workplaces could be putting in to support the neurodiverse staff that might be coming through? So if someone discloses, I mean, we've talked about awareness and training. I'm really glad you mentioned training because um, of the work we're doing together in developing our e-learning courses around um, dyslexia in the workplace and how important training is for people. But do you think there's other areas that um, workplaces could be developing that could support a more inclusive environment for people? I think that um, there's so many positive things. Even the COVID situation, Shay, has helped with the flexibility element of a workplace because it all sits under this really big umbrella um, of really being aware that people thrive at work and will do their best work in a an environment that's sort of what I call niche construction, you know, where it's constructed for them. So the more a workplace is open to being curious and asking questions and helping their employees be their best at work, the employees themselves will come up with the answers. So the solutions are there. Um, they're not highly expensive to do. Um, it's really, really, really to do with a workplace's willingness to be open and to encourage uh, encourage the conversation and, in, and where that is in all workplace settings, if you're trying to change culture, leadership is the first place to start. So it's definitely a, a grassroots groundswell movement to champion a cause but when you have leaders that actually role model um, inclusiveness, well, then it starts the conversation and it says this is the behaviour that's expected for our workplace and others will follow. So I think um, that's the responsibility of leaders to actually uh, put this on the agenda and realise that if, we actually, if, if they um, make a workplace the most inclusive and uh, help people thrive and be able to participate and learn in a working environment at their best, obviously that'll be a better outcome for the employee and the employer. Do you think um, those in leadership roles that are neurodiverse, do you think they have a, a responsibility in a way to um, champion or to step up to help change that culture? And disclosure is a very hard topic and it's very, very personal. Oh. Yeah, what a, what a great question. <laughs> oh my from God, a, that's a great question. That's a bit hard to answer. From a leadership perspective, are there ways, or is it, if I pose it differently, do you think there's ways that organisations in their culture could support particularly leaders to step up if they are neurodiverse? Because a lot of what I hear is there are many leaders out there, CEOs, board members, people from all works of life, um, that could, if they step forward and said, I'd have this challenge too, could make all the difference in a workplace. How can we create a safe environment where particularly leaders can feel comfortable in being able to disclose to help build that safety and awareness within an organisation? 
Look, I think actually talking about it one-on-one -on -one with people and in um, like toolbox talks or town halls, that seems to be like an appropriate setting where you're actually face-to-face -face with your workforce. I think that for a leader to be put on the spot with an expectation to um, do some sort of media type situation, so it turns into social media around their um, learning difficulty or if they're on the autism spectrum or neurodiverse, I think that's challenging. And also I, I'm quite an advocate for being able to um, support these movements without having to be someone that has a diagnosis or, or has one of those conditions because then you don't want to actually, all the leaders that are really passionate about neurodiversity, you know, they should be able to champion their cause as well, even if they don't have one of the conditions themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So I think anybody that's um, willing to share examples and um, share stories, I think that um, storytelling is extremely powerful. Um, leadership examples are really powerful. But when it comes to workplaces, I think the, the message is not so much the individuals. It's actually at our workplace, we value inclusiveness. We value um, difference and diversity. We understand diversity of thought. We understand that people will come up, come and be their best at work through different conditions. And we want you to be your best. So talk to us about what it is that helps you deliver that. So it's like a, an open conversation. I think that messaging um, is really powerful. And then if there's follow-up, examples of where people have actually achieved and had a really good um, outcome by speaking up and, and sharing what their requ accommodation requirements were um, and showcasing those case studies or case examples, you know, just even within their own workplace, then that will encourage other people to, to um, share their story. Yeah, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Because we need people within organisations to be champion, whether it's someone that has a difficulty or disability, alongside people that don't. And it's um, it's hard, like if you stand up and say you need accommodations, then you're kind of highlighting that something's, there's a challenge or you're needing help with something. So mm -hmm. how do we create an environment where it's okay to be able to, you know, as you are saying, it's about if you're performing really well, how do we um, support workplaces to say when someone's struggling that it's also okay? Because everyone struggles. No one's perfect in the workplace. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. if you had a bad day, you could be going through a divorce. I mean, there's multiple reasons why people may struggle in the workplace and need additional help. So how do we make it safe for anybody to be able to, to be able to perform at their best but also be able to say sometimes I just need help with something? Yeah, exactly. You, you really need um, a workplace that um, fosters psychological safety at the end of the day. Um, and as we know from Project Aristotle, um, that the big Google project on high performing teams, that's the number one um, element of a high performing team is psychological safety. So if people feel comfortable, psychologically safe and with their immediate teams and their um, team leaders, they will actually speak up um, and then they can make those accommodations. So this is how it sort of comes full circle, Shay. It's a really little, little bit tricky because at the end of the day, it really comes down to leadership behaviours and a, a great leader could can go about be, never being specifically trained on any of the neurodiverse or equal opportunity or any of those topics if they're actually already came to the workplace with those skills. However, a lot of leaders aren't born as we know they're made. So if you are actually missing some of those skills, well, that's where the training comes in. So I think the what workplaces can do for strategies is to actually start with, as I said before, being curious and um, looking at their workplace and saying, do we actually have a culture that promotes psychological safety? Do we actually promote high functioning teams, high performance teams. And in doing so, do we actually offer accommodations? Where's the examples of us doing that? And once they start asking questions, they're going to find that they have got that already happening. 
um, and then they'll probably find that they've got some situations that aren't as good as they could be and then they can look to what's working well like an appreciative inquiry type situation what's already working well here how have we achieved that in that team and how can we transfer those um, wins into other parts of the organization so it, it, most workplaces will have a, a little bit of that happening which is you know you know how people say they don't leave a workplace they leave a leader Mm -hmm. <laughs> stay in a workplace because it all comes down to leadership no pressure on the leaders but mm -hmm. <laughs> it does flipping it over yes it does i'm thinking of a previous workplace um if we flip it around so we've have talked a lot about strategies for leaders in the workplace and coming from the top around culture change if we had a team member who had dyslexia or neurodiverse, do you have any suggestions for them if they wanted to disclose or they wanted to step up to, um, to voice their challenges or their lived experience or that they've actually got a, they're really strong in this one area and it's partly because of their diversity? Do you have any strategies or tips for the employee to help them be able to self-advocate? I think is a long-winded way of asking that question. Yeah, I think the self-advocacy is um, the most, it's so critical for individual success in a workplace situation, I guess, no matter what, what your situation is. But the people that I've seen that have um, really thrived in workplaces have been confident enough to self-advocate. And in those circumstances, they those people are the ones that can really step up and really help other people that aren't in that position and they are actually struggling. So those that can self-advocate and actually say, these are the accommodations that I need where I'm not actually, I'm not so great at that. Um, I'm going to put headphones on um, in an open plan environment. Um, I've seen people with different um, colour coding systems where they have um, different highlighters at their desk. So that will just share um, their mood and how they're feeling in the workplace. So green is good, yellow, pretty with caution if a red highlighter, um, I'm not having a good day. So, you know, don't, please don't disrupt me. Some people have specifically said they need all the meeting um, agenda sent to them like 24 hours before each meeting because that is how they mentally prepare. So there's lots of accommodations that happen for people um, I've seen other people that have utilized their autistic people that have utilized their auditing ability um, opposite to say a dyslexic person and actually said um, I'm happy to actually pick across a whole range of um, small houses in a warehouse and picking environment I'm happy to pick a whole heap of different products across a whole heap of different orders and consolidate them and do that all day every day whereas other people have found it very tiring to um, process that much detail at once um, yet this particular team member thrived on it and enjoyed that and much preferred that to picking bulk orders and there was also another um, two team members that I knew one, one had, um, had had anxiety and preferred not to have too much social contact and another one um, with autism. And the two of them worked as a pair together and did a lot of um, really, really um, repetitive work with um, labelling. And um, everyone else wanted to rotate the labelling and only do like one hour at a time. And it was quite... a quite a task to actually manage the rosters but they'd actually they'd actually come forward and said we like it if we, you can put us together to work um it was a male female mix and they were just in their 20s and they said oh if you put us together to work we get along really well um, for these reasons and we're happy to do this work for eight hours straight twice a week they didn't want to do it all week obviously but they actually did the whole team's work in eight hours in two <laughs> how good is that That's and they yeah, and it was like an accommodation where they got to chat together and yeah. she, the girl really enjoyed it because, as I said, she sort of found the social overwhelm. It was a huge workplace, 600 workforce um, on one side. So, yeah, just different things like that happen that um, people can play to their strengths. And if someone wanted to disclose to their manager and they have an HR department, 
Um, is there anything that you think would help them in their self advocating any resources or um, is it just knowing what accommodations you need is the, the best starting point if you're going to go to HR and are you wanting to have those conversations with management? When someone comes in to as a HR person and says, these are the accommodations that I require, it's so impressive. It's really so impressive. I, I just, you know, when, when people have done that with me, I can't think of anything more than trying to deliver everything that they require. You, just, you want to bend over backwards for them um, because they're prepared and, they're, and they've made it really simple. It's just, it's very efficient. You just go ahead and do exactly what they're after. <laughs> so um, that's it. I mean, it's only if there's circumstances that extremely challenging to do with like the mechanics of a workplace, whether you're having to change mach machinery, noise levels or um, machinery, like because I, I said, spent a bit of time in manufacturing where people have claustrophobia or something like that and the machines are set out where it's much harder to create accommodations um, in those situations. So sometimes workplace environments physically are difficult to make the accommodations um, but then you can actually change the job function or then again do rotations so that they're not in that environment all day so there's um yeah a variety of people that may need a variety of accommodations within the workplace not just the neuro not just people that are neurodiverse oh absolutely i mean yeah um this is the thing, uh, people, leaders and HR professionals are very used to making accommodations for people. There's a lot of workplaces where, you know, Joe can't work with Mary and Joe and Mary had an altercation and um, as part of that um, performance situation that happened between the two employees, one employee has said that, you know, for the next six months I'd, I'd prefer not to um, be in the same room or on the same shift as them. And unless the workplace can't accommodate it, it's a reasonable adjustment, like a reasonable expectation. So that's got nothing to do with the topic of today, Shay, but it's just, I guess the point is that workplaces make accommodations for people all the time. And, and it's actually that people don't talk up and people don't, workplaces haven't been asking about learning difficulties or mental health accommodations or um, accommodations in relation to autism that that have come across as though they're more difficult than they really are is what the point that I'm trying to say yeah and I think it's um it's a great example and you know showcasing the variety of accommodations needed um just if two people clash is you know in I think helps our listeners to understand that they are doing it every day and it isn't a, um a big shift to help someone who has dyslexia or autism or um, and it may not be an expensive accommodation at all and it's not that scary because really you could be doing it every day without even really realising it. Um, and so I think it's a really important point that you make and normalises uh, the accommodations that someone that's neurodiverse may need. Absolutely. I think that the accommodation piece is already happening and it's just bringing the stories to life, understanding what that workplace um, can accommodate and where there might be it might be like that machine example might be some limitations to what people can actually do you know you you can't it's very difficult to work in hospitality and not be client facing customer facing and then if uh, unless you just work in the kitchen for example so there's just some things where a workplace settings um, not the quite quite the right one so that's to my point with niche construction I think that the more a, a person understands what accommodations they need, um, then they create a workplace setting that actually suits their skill set, um, which is why people sometimes have never dis disclosed and it's not until the workplace changes that all of a sudden it becomes a problem. And I think it's great that you've given such diverse examples across different industries because I think um, a lot of time we get stuck in thinking that it's just accommodations that may need to occur in a corporate setting or an office setting, but you, you need to be thinking across all industries of what type of accommodations may be needed for somebody. So I think that's been great to talk yeah. about that variety. Yeah, I think that we, um, 
yeah, we don't want to be streamlining everyone to say that everyone that has autism is going to work in tech and everyone with dyslexia is going to be a salesperson, <laughs> you know, but they're not going to, um, you know, they're not going to, they're going to avoid uh, being an accountant or doing something that um, requires a lot of writing because the irony is, is that um, a lot of people with dyslexia enjoy a lot of creative storytelling and a, and a lot of writing um, once they've actually mastered reading and writing. Yeah, it's, I think the hardest ones, Shay, are people that um, probably in that age group where the school system has let them down. Um, it's very different now to how it was 20 years ago, um, is my understanding. There are some people in the workforce in their, in their sort of 40s, 50s and 60s that had horrible educational situations and therefore have not actually thrived in, in the workplace setting. They haven't lived to, up to their full potential. And I think it's an opportunity for leaders to look out for people that might be working in environments like sales or warehousing, you know, that are actually could contribute a lot more to the workplace than, than you realise. Yeah, it's sad because it's not even people from 40 my age and over. It's, you know, we hear stories and people in their 20s and 30s that are, that are going through those challenges uh, in the workplace. Or there's also a lot of people that haven't had the opportunity to be assessed that, that struggle and have the characteristics of someone that might have dyslexia or autism, but the financial barrier of getting an assessment or knowing that they can get an assessment can um, not be there. And so uh, you have a cohort of employees that may be having challenges where they've never actually got the opportunity for that formal diagnosis to know why they're having the challenges. It's, yes, it's a definite, definite issue, but, you know, encouragingly, I was having, uh, went out to meet um, an ex-colleague today, actually, and we went out for a walk together and um, she, she has a three-year-old and she was telling me that um, her son's had an early diagnosis and um, of autism because she noticed a few behaviours and obviously it's on both sides of her family, different parts of the spectrum, and yeah, she's already got speech and OT organised and um, support from NDIS from the government with an early intervention program um, for two years. And it's just fantastic. I was so excited for it um, because, yeah, I, I've actually done all of that myself for William without sort of the government's support. But I knew when he was two that, yeah, there was delays, speech delays and, and noticed the colours he wasn't picking up on that. However, at the same time, noticed that he was highly bright. So it wasn't making sense. It was like, oh, how can you be really intelligent there? But yet this is a delay. So then straight away you think, okay, well, there's, there's a difference. Something's going on here. But, yeah, I was really excited to hear that um, my friend has, has that support for her, her son um, so early. Yeah, yeah like and autism is extremely well-funded in Australia. Um, compared to other neurodiversities such as dyslexia where it's not unexpected it's expected of a parent actually to fund all of it though in Victoria they just announced a 1.6 billion dollar um, funding for students with disabilities including dyslexia which is the first time ever which was so exciting to see in schools change coming through but it's we could have a whole different podcast on um, the fact that children are missing out on assessments that have dyslexia and that there is no funding under NDIS or anything at the moment. Um, no, yes, which is me onto that topic. I can no, go. no, we could have a whole podcast on a whole podcast. But the point is that uh, you know, if it's great that that's there for you know, that is fantastic that it's there for yeah. them. And yes, I wish it was there for um, dyslexia. But there is also um, some fantastic tutors available for. For, for kids with dyslexia. And I think. Yeah, and it's a movement and we've seen the autism movement come through with all the funding for children and the movement within the workplace. And, I, you know, I really hope that um, the movement progresses to children and young people and adults in the workplace um, that have dyslexia and other learning disabilities as well, considering it's one of the highest prevalent disabilities um, that we have, but it's, it takes one population to make that change and it kind of has this flow and effect into others. And so it is exciting and it's fantastic that your friend was able to tap into those resources and have a diagnosis so early because it is so important. Um, and I'm, I'm 
feel so confident that that will happen for um, families with children with dyslexia in the future as well. Yep, but not for now. Now, at the moment, we're totally (laughs) self-funded. We are totally self-funded, but I I live in hope that that will change (laughs) through all the work that we do. Um, But we digress, as I tend to do sometimes uh, with these conversations, because there's so much to talk about. And I think, you know, today's been such an important conversation and some really important key messages for particularly leaders around awareness raising and education and, you know, changing culture from the top so teams feel psychologically safe um, in their work environment, regardless of whatever challenge they're facing that they can disclose, whether it's personal, physical, mental. So I think, you know, it's been a fantastic opportunity to talk to you today, Sally, and to continue to raise awareness in the workplace of um, all the differences that come in the workplace and that they're all important and we all bring a fantastic contribution if we're Um, given the right tools, we really can thrive. So before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to add this afternoon? I think my closing comment would be to, um, you know, as to to leaders, don't don't shy away. Um, Don't lean into this conversation. It's not as difficult as you think. And um, just asking um, individual people what sort of support What's, how can I support you and what support do you need? Um, what can we do together? Those sort of three questions um, will just open up a world of conversation um, and you don't have to promise the world. You can just start somewhere and then work on a plan to move you know, into more and more accommodations as required. And um, also, you know, be curious. I, I mean, particularly if you're listening to this podcast, I, I think ask yourself the question, has anyone disclosed a learning difficulty to... to to myself has anyone done that um am I aware of anyone in the workplace is neurodiverse or has autism or dyslexia is it being talked about and um you know if the answers to those questions are yes excellent to go out and ask other people has anyone done that with you and start that conversation and if the answer is no well then that's a great conversation to start with start talking to other leaders in your leadership team about because you, I guess you want to find out what's happening in our workplace and um, do people feel comfortable talking about it? And I think that's a great way to finish the podcast, particularly as, as um, we've gone through COVID, there's never been a more opportunistic time to be asking those questions because everyone's needed support and help in transitioning to home or just the whole change that's occurred across the world so I think you know it's actually a really exciting time to be curious and to be asking those questions of all your staff um, and all your teams. Yep and look at all the success stories there's so many positive stories that have come out of COVID in workplace settings around remote teams and building empathy and so forth and there's also been stories around the challenges lots of stories around the challenges it's not all rose colored glasses it's just that the fact that we're talking about the challenges is, is also positive. The fact that people can share, oh, I'm so, I've got Zoom fatigue. I've got, you know, I've, I'm, it's challenging the blur between work and home and so forth. These are conversations, are, like you said, Jay, about differences and flexibility and inclusion and the fact that people do things differently. And that's the same conversation when it comes to neurodiversity. It's just about having awareness of differences well thank you so much for coming on the show today i've learned a lot it leaves me thinking a lot about how we can continue to raise awareness in this space and i just it's been wonderful and your um suggestions are really valuable and i hope that our listeners get as much out of them as i have so thank you so much for coming on the show sally thanks shane thanks so much take care To find out more about Sally and all the work she's doing, head to deardyslexic.com or check out her LinkedIn profile. Did you know we now have a new live Q&A series called Question Dis, D-Y-S, created during COVID to help our community feel more connected. Each month, I interview a fellow dyslexic about all things dyslexia and life. The Question Dis series is running through Facebook Live. I really hope you can come along and join us for one of these sessions. If you haven't already done so yet, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we do at the Foundation. Head to deardyslexic.com. 
And don't forget, if there is anything you have heard today that was distressing, please call Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36 or Lifeline on 13 11 14. If there is a topic you would like discussed on the show, please email us, admin at ddyslexic.com. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.